we continue our teaching this week as we look at what we call the eight major types of prophets. We are going to be looking at this this week, the eight major types of prophets. And I am certain when we are done here tonight, you will have gained some insight into the various diversities that are present within the prophetic office and the prophetic grace. We have been looking at our key scripture, Ephesians 4, 11, and he gave some, Jesus gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now a prophet, let me remind you, simply is one who speaks on behalf of God or one who speaks for God. They are in second in governmental order to the apostles, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. I want to give you seven observations from Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. Seven observations that I have uh, taken out of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Number one, Jesus gave gifts to the church. We have been saying this, that the ascension of our Lord Jesus caused a dissemination of spiritual graces from our Lord. And those graces are called gifts. Number two, Jesus made us know what those gifts are. And they are apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, five of them. And the gifts that are given to us by the Lord Jesus are dimensions of his authority and operations through Jesus Christ. They allow us to function in his capacity as if he was here carrying out those roles. Third observation, the gifts are ministries, functions, titles, and offices. Each gift is an office, meaning it carries spiritual authority. Each gift is a title, meaning it's a position of honor, dignity, and evidence of the individual being elevated to such service. Each gift is a ministry, that is the calling, work, or vocation, spiritual vocation of the individual. And each gift is a function, a natural activity to the individual who was given that gift for the purpose of revealing Christ to others and preparing them to be like him. Number four, there are more than one individuals who have received those gifts or offices. The verse allows us, that's Ephesians 4.11, allows us to know that many individuals will be given the ascension gifts that are released by Christ. It's this indicative by how the verse reads. He gave some, some is not one. He gave some, that's more than one. Apostles, that's the plural. Number five, there are more than one type of expressions within those gifts. Each individual that is elevated to the offices express the office differently. So there are no two apostles who are the same. There are no two prophets who are the same. And the list goes on. Number six, the gifts have diversities of operations. The manner in which the gifts operate in each individual, whether they have the same office or not, is different. The manner in which each individual operates in the office is different. And number seven, the gifts comes from the Lord. So there needs to be no competition, no comparison, no vilification, no rivalry, no contention. It is the Lord who chooses who to elevate and grace with his gifts and authority. We don't choose that. He does. And because he does, we don't need to compete, compare, vilify, or contend. We don't need any rivalry within the gifts. And so these are seven observations from Ephesians 4 and verse 11. Now I want to move on to give you seven words that are translated as prophecy in the scriptures. Now these words are important. Why? Because out of these seven words, we get to understand the various types of prophets that exist. And so let me um, say to you that 
every individual who is elevated to the prophetic office, they have to be spoken to by the Lord in some manner. They don't get elevated without a revelation of Jesus Christ. And each prophet is connected to what I call a prophetic channel. We spoke about this in our earlier teachings, where they receive messages through a particular modality, channels and modalities. Now, the prophet may have one or more modalities, talking about the ways God speaks. We're going to be teaching about that, that are common to that prophet because of the grace that is on that prophet's life. So this means that the channel and the modality that is common to the prophet ought not to be used as a measuring stick for others and how they hear God because each person hear God, hears God differently. And so why is this necessary? Because we have not been given the same grace to hear God in the same way. Okay, so we don't expect that uh, each believer will operate the same way as another believer or each prophet will operate the same way as another prophet. And let me just interject this here to say that it is wrong for a prophet to be forcing you to hear God the way that he hears God or she hears God. It is wrong because the grace that is on the prophet's life might not be on your life. And so we, we have to be careful how we preach messages and teach, teach things that may cause people to feel less than because they are not seeing and hearing the way you are seeing and hearing. We have to be careful about that. Now, let me remind you what channels are. Let me remind you what channels are. Channels speaks of the connections through which the prophetic uh, revelations are released. So this includes seven of them that we had discussed. Number one, God. That means God directly speaking. Number two, the scriptures. The prophet gets messages from the scriptures. Daniel read the scrolls of Jeremiah and he got a prophetic revelation. Uh, number three, illumination of scripture, the Holy Spirit opening up your understanding to a particular scripture. That's prophetic, okay? The angels, angels that are being sent to the prophet, that, that's, that's a realm. The office of the prophet itself, the grace that is upon the prophet gives him access, okay? So because he's in that office, he doesn't necessarily need to hear a thus saith the Lord. He can determine and see certain things by virtue of the grace. There is the gift of prophecy, where is the Holy Spirit working through that gift, okay? The stirring of that gift to give a message. And then there's a spirit of prophecy where somebody comes into contact with the prophetic atmosphere and begins to prophesy. We spoke about all of this. So these are channels. And then we have modalities. Modalities are the various ways that God speaks to us. There are 21 of them that I'll be teaching about. The written word, dreams, visions, audible voice, visitations, birth signs, wonders, inspiration, a stirring, the Maseroth. Yes, we will talk about that. Circumstances, windows and doors, names, silence, nature, angels, intuition, perception, impression, animals, recorded material, the inner voice. So those are 21 modalities, various ways God speaks. Don't worry about it. We'll teach it. Now, within the scriptures, there are certain words that are translated as prophecy. And you will not get an understanding of what those words mean or the depth of their meaning because you are reading in English. And so they just translate these words as prophecy because in the end, it is a prophecy. But what kind of prophecy? How did these prophecies come uh, can we learn anything from these words about the prophecies? So this is what I'm opening up to you as we move into the types of prophets. Now, these words give us an idea into the channel, the mode, and the style by which the prophecy is given or received. Now, when these channels and modes become common to that prophet, that prophet may be directed into a particular sphere 
of prophetic operation, which makes that prophet a particular type of prophet. Now let's examine these words. The first one is Nebuah. You can find that in 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 8. Now, this is not the only place you will find this word, okay? I'm just giving one or two scriptures. 2 Chronicles 15, 8. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols. Now, you see that word there? He took courage. Now, notice what the prophecy did. Because if you notice what the prophecy did, you will understand the type of the prophetic that is operating here. And you'll see it later on. He put, took courage, put away the abominable idols out of the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities which he had taken from the Mount, from Mount Ephraim and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. Now, Nebuah means a prediction, a prophecy, a prediction or a prophecy. Now, Nebuah, when it is given... It is spoken or written. It can come in a song, a writing, or a speech. So you wouldn't get that from just reading that in the English. So this prophecy that comes, uh, the Nebuah type of prophecy, it comes through the inspiration of the Spirit. And it is connected to Nabi. And they are closely related. But they are slightly different. Now, Nebuah is a prophecy that may be given in song speech or writing so this inspiration it will cause songs to come writings to come or speech so you'll find singers poets psalmists authors in this realm of the prophetic okay the nebuah now immediately as you hear this you'll begin to think about inspiration that if this prophecy causes somebody to take courage that means the person is being inspired. Faith is being affected. They are being motivated. Their spirit is being lifted up. So you, be, you begin to get an understanding of what is going on with this kind of prophetic that is happening. And somebody might be singing, writing, or, or, or um, yes, singing or writing or giving a, spe giving a speech. And you might not think anything of it. But that thing that they are doing is stirring your spirit and you're wondering, okay, this thing is motivating me. This thing is inspiring me. But before you, you don't know that that's a prophet. Now, this is the mistake that a lot of people have been making because the church has not understood clearly the prophetic office. They wrongly put people and designate them by titles that are not biblical that are not in the scriptures. And when you do that, you diminish the authority of the individual in the realm of the spirit because you are not affirming who they are. And because you're not affirming who they are, you cannot receive them in the dimension and in the capacity with which the Holy Spirit wants to release them to you. I want you to understand this. This is serious. The church needs to undergo a reformation as it relates to the gifts and the callings of Christ. Number two, let's deal with the Nabi. This is a second word. Let's deal with the Nabi. So we have Genesis 20, Numbers, Genesis 20, verse 7, Numbers 12, verse 6. Let's read these two scriptures. Now, therefore, restore the man and his wife, Genesis 20, verse 7, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, Know thou that thou shalt surely die, you and everything that you have. This was the, the, um, the story of Abraham. God said he was a prophet. He was a Nabi. Now, Nabi is the general word that refers to a prophet. But it doesn't necessarily tell you what type of prophet it is all the time. So you might see the Bible say this man is a prophet. He's a Nabi. Because that's a common word that is used to refer to prophets. But it doesn't necessarily tell you. The type, you'd have to dig sometimes to find it. Now, Numbers 12, 6, he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, a nabi among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak to him in a dream, the nabi. Now, a, a, the nabi is a prophet who speaks by the inspiration of God but they are functioning in the realm of visions and dreams. 
Now, the person gets messages from God, this Nabi, in various ways. But the messages they are getting can inspire you to do things. But they draw you to the fear of the Lord. Nabi prophets, how do you know them? They begin small. They start small. Small words. Like small light drizzle, drops of rain. And then they it, it increases and increases and increases until it becomes a heavy downpour. The Nabi has what we call fruitful lips, successful prophecies and prayers. They are in that dimension, prayer. And Nabis could be motivators, fortifiers, encouragers, just like in the Nebua realm, with the difference of the Nebua is that they are they 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 operate in the dimension of singing, writing and speech okay but the nabi uh, doesn't necessarily operate in that realm so there's a slight difference the two words are related but slight difference number three word that is translated as prophecy is the word masa proverbs 30 verse 1 and 31 verse 1 and isaiah 13 verse 1 now let's look at these the words of agor the son of jake even the prophecy the man spake unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel and Yukal. That's Proverbs 30, verse 1. Then 31, verse 1. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. So you are reading the book of Proverbs and you don't realize that these things are not just wisdom words. There are also prophecy inside of that wisdom. Isaiah 13, 13, verse 1. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. Now, immediately you get to know, okay, prophecy, prophecy, but Isaiah 13 verse 1 says burden. So what is Masa? Masa is a burden, a weight or heavy impression on the heart. Burdens and impressions on the heart by the Holy Ghost. That's a prophecy. Ah, I bet you didn't know that one. Individuals with a heavy undertone of intercession or those who are burdened with the things of the spirit are operating in the masa. When God puts a burden on you, whether of a situation, a condition, a person, it's the Holy Spirit giving you a prophetic message, a prophetic unction to intercede to change a matter. Mm -hmm. We're going somewhere. So that's masa. The burden of the Lord. And you'll see that a lot in the writings of the prophet. The burden of the Lord concerning Babylon. The burden of the Lord concerning uh, uh, this city. And the burden of the Lord concerning that city. What was it? It was the prophecy being given to the prophet. Coming out of the prophet as a prayer. So that matters can change for that place, people, or, or situation. Number four, the word. Kaza. Now, Kaza is, um, let's look at Job 15, 17. It says, I will show thee, hear me, and that which I have seen, I will declare. Hebrews 1, 1, the burden which Abacoc the prophet did see. Psalm 27, verse 4, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now, what is kaza? Kaza means to have a vision like a seer. It means to gaze at something, to mentally perceive something, or supernatural sight by visions and dreams. This is kaza. So kaza is to see or observe something, whether in the mind, in reality, or by supernatural sight. Now, prophecies given by visions impressed upon the prophet is what we call kaza. And the visions come in many ways. So when kaza is operating, this vision can come in three primary ways. Number one, you see directly. You are seeing this thing directly. The supernatural is opened in front of you and you are seeing it. Number two, you see in the mind. So the Holy Spirit is impressing these images on your mind. It's not your thoughts. It is, the, it is the thoughts of the Spirit that is coming to you. It can come to you in several ways. 
It can come to you as a thought. It can come to you as a revelation flash. So many different ways. You see it in the mind. And number three, you perceive with intelligence or by experience, meaning you are taken into the vision. So there are visions that you see and there are visions that you are taken into it as if you're a part of it. All of this is kaza. You will not see that in the English Bible. What you, All you will see is just prophecy. But when you investigate, you will get an understanding of how the prophecy is coming to the prophet. And so when kaza happens, you will say it exactly how you see it with a great measure of detail. What does this tell you? The seers are in this realm, the kaza. We're going to get there because we're getting to the types of prophets, but let's lay the, found, the, 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 the groundwork. Number five word, Hebrew word is bene. Now, Daniel 9 verse 2 and 1 Kings 3 verse 9. Let's look at them. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood. That word there is bene, understood. By books, the number of years whereof the Lord Whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So let's unpack this. Daniel Bene understood. In other words, the season and time came for the 70 years captivity to be over. And the spirit of the Lord moved upon Daniel to search the scrolls of the prophets. And he began to read the prophecy of Jeremiah and the Holy Ghost quickened his understanding that he gained insight into the prophecy. That's Bene. Now, there are times when you are reading the word of God and Bene happens to you where the Holy Spirit gives you insight into that which is not too obvious to the naked eye. First Kings chapter three, verse nine. It says, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people. This was Solomon praying for the spirit of prophecy. This was Solomon praying for understanding. And we now think that understanding is not in the prophetic realm understanding is in the prophetic realm it is a part of the prophetic grace give thy servant bene a bene heart a prophetic heart my god to judge thy people listen you can't discern you can't make judgment without a prophetic heart so he says give thy servant bene heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge this so great a people. So Solomon was saying, listen, this uh, judgment by book is not the, the ability I need. I need prophetic ability in my heart to understand matters. To see through things that others cannot see through. So if you now go back to the story of Solomon and the two mothers that came before him concerning the babies and the judgment that Solomon delivered. Now that wasn't just uh, Solomon and wisdom. No, that was a prophetic spirit that was able to discern and see through and understand and accurately give a judgment that brought solution that's the kind of spirit we need we need the bene the understanding spirit that's a prophetic grace you can pray for it so bene means to have discernment to have insight to have understanding it is the prophetic grace to judge between matters whenever the holy spirit wants to speak to the prophet so that he understands what the Lord is saying in a particular season through a particular scripture that is written, the Lord will open the understanding of the prophet so that he sees what others can't and understand what others are finding difficult to comprehend. There are, there are two men that I know now, and um, I'm going to call their names. They are reputable men, uh, Perry Stone and Jonathan Kahn. 
they operate in the Bene. If you listen to these two men, they operate in this realm, this dimension of the Bene. People will look at them and they will not say that they are prophets. Those two guys are prophets. They operate in the prophetic realm. You understand? In the Bene. So that, that is what happened. Now, Bene is what happened to Daniel the prophet as he made inquiry concerning the prophecy of Jeremiah and the timing of the Babylonian captivity. God made Daniel understand the dynamics of the prophecy so that he could be moved into prayer to effect and affect the next phase of the prophetic word that is given to Jeremiah. One prophet got the word, but another prophet had to move the next phase of it into execution and manifestation by the Bene grace that is in the prophetic. Now you are, you are beginning to understand we are all prophets, but we are all not the same. We operate differently and we are all needed. Our graces are needed. And so you can appreciate when I say, let us stop comparing, contrasting. Let us stop causing rivalry and contention. And let us accept each other in the grace and dimension that God has given. And let us stop diminishing other people's grace as if it is not relevant. No, the grace on every prophet is relevant. It is relevant. And let us stop this nonsense in the church in thinking that there are only just one type of prophet. And if you're not doing certain things, then you're not a prophet. Come on, let's stop that nonsense. Let's get into the word of God. And by the word of God, let's be liberated. We are seeing this here now. Let's go to the Greek words. Two Greek words that I want to give you. Number six, prophetia. Matthew 13, verse 14. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 20. Matthew 13, 14 says, And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, By hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. Now, where, where is this prophecy? Isaiah 6, verse 9 and 10. You can read that. That's a cross-reference for Matthew 13, 14. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 20. Despise not prophesying. Despise not prophetia. Now, prophetia is a noun. It refers to the actual prophecy itself. It is a prediction of future events by the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So prophetia is prediction. It is a discourse emanating from divine inspiration and declaring the purposes of God, whether by reproving and admonishing the wicked or comforting the afflicted, or revealing things hidden, especially by foretelling future events. So there are dimensions to prophetia. It's just one Greek word. But all of this is captured in this prophetic ability, in the prophetia. And number seven is the propheteo. Now, these two words are related. Matthew eleven thirteen. It says, for all the prophets and the law, propheteo until John, prophesied until John. Luke 1, 67. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, I'm, 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 I know you're getting it now. One is a noun, the other is a verb. Revelation 11, 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy, propheteo. A thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Now, propheteo is the verb. It refers to the actual act of prophesying. And so it is to exercise the prophetic gift or office by the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, this particular act of prophesying speaks somewhat to revealing things in a manner that teaches us, edifies us. So these seven words are the most common in the scriptures in terms of translation to the English word prophecy. But when you read the English Bible, you will not get the fulsome understanding of what is happening behind the scenes, the channels, the modalities, and the deliveries of these prophecies, what they are, how they came about. But understanding the root now gives you 
a clearer picture as to what is going on and as to even the types of prophets that do exist out there. Now, having laid that groundwork now, I want to take you into the eight major types of prophets that exist. Eight of them. And I'm going to give you them tonight. Number one, the inspirational prophet. Number two, the preaching prophet. Number three, the seer prophet. Number four, the watchman prophet. Number five, the visionary dreaming prophet. Number six, the predicting prophet. Number seven, the teaching prophet. Number eight, the martyred prophet. I'm going to give you all eight of them tonight by the grace of God. Are you still there with me? Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Now, eight categories of prophets, but many differences due to the diversities of ministries that can be worked through them by the Holy Spirit. Eight categories of prophets. Yes, eight categories of prophets, but many diversities. Now, the basic elements of a prophet is that he can see, hear, and communicate what he is hearing and seeing from God. That's basic. If you're a prophet, you can either see or hear, but you can definitely communicate. Not all prophets see. Not all prophets hear audibly. But every prophet communicates. The dimension to which the prophet sees or hears is dependent on the type of prophet God has called him to be and the grace that is placed upon that prophet's life. I'm using the pronoun he universally. Now let's get into the categories of prophets. Number one, the inspirational prophet, the Nabi. Genesis 20, verse 7, Numbers 12, verse 6. Now, Nabi means to bubble up or stir up the river. It means to call. Nabi speaks for the Lord to the people. Nabi describes an individual who is stirred up in their spirit. Now, remember, one of the modalities that we mentioned is called the stirring. We're going to be teaching that. That's one of the ways that God speaks. The stirring. Nabi operates in the modality of the stirring. Nabi is a prophet who speaks by inspiration to declare the things of God. He's an inspirational prophet. He has what we call fruitful lips. This prophet prophesies by faith and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They are hearing it and they are saying it at the same time. It's like their ears and their mouth is in sync. This prophet hears God like rain falling. It begins small, like one word that turns to sentences, that turns to paragraphs, that may turn to books. Now, these prophets hear words and they usually function with music also. So when a Nabi comes around, Nabi needs music. The Nabi prophet is one who pours forth the declarations of God. Give a Nabi prophet music and you start connecting him to the prophetic realm and he will begin to prophesy. This is why music is so important to prophets, especially the ones who are Nabi. And if the music ain't right, if the notes ain't right, if the voice ain't right, if the singing ain't right, the Nabi cannot function. Because they need certain things to ascend into the prophetic dimension. Certain sounds. They need certain uh, uh, voices. They need certain notes to be able to function. And when you hit that note in the prophetic, when you hit that plateau, that sound, the Nabi is now able to soar on, the, on, on that dimension of sound and begin to prophesy to you. That's the Nabi. So there is... An exception that God made, he said that the possibility of prophets exist among the Israelites of which Moses was a part. Moses was a Nabi. He was a Nabi. Now, God made an exception with Moses. God elevated Moses in the prophetic office 
as one to whom he speaks with face to face. This means that Moses was in the Shekinah presence of the Lord. No riddles, no metaphors, no idioms, no figures of speech, plain language from the mouth of God. What Moses spoke was not his own words. It was not his interpretation of what he felt, or what he was seeing or what he was hearing. It was as it was. That is why those five books of Moses, they are so power packed with, with layers and layers and layers of dimension because God spoke those words. That is why we can go into Genesis and look at names and get a prophetic picture of what Jesus is going to do just by looking at names because it was God who spoke those words. So Moses was an exception and there was no other prophet like Moses that God spoke to in the way God spoke to Moses face to face that way in the Shekinah manifest presence of God like that. No other prophet was like that. So he was an exceptional Nabi. Now, number two, the preaching prophet. Now, let's, let's back up a little bit. The, the inspirational prophet, in this dimension, you will have psalmists and poets and writers and motivators and encouragers and, and, and men and women who will inspire your faith and encourage your faith and strengthen your faith. This is the Nabi. When they come, their, your faith is being affected. So there are people who they are operating as motivators. Today, some of them are called life coaches. They are prophets. Not all of them, but some of them are prophets because of the way in which they are operating. And I'm talking about the ones that are from the kingdom of God. Some of them are actually prophets and they are going about by wrong designation of, of, of titles. Because let me tell you something. In the realm of the spirit, devils, rep, um, uh, 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 they, they know authority. And one of the things that give you recognition in the realm of the spirit are the titles that you carry. Listen to me. Don't, don't let certain demonic agendas fool you. If titles were not important, then God would just be Yahweh. He wouldn't be king. He wouldn't be Lord. Those are not names. Those are titles. They are important because they designate authority. And authority gives you access to dimensions and realms. Authority allows you to command certain operations of angelic powers so don't let them fool you and so what the enemy has done is to strip the authority the spiritual authority of the church by changing titles so that people will not be known by certain titles and they cannot be received by certain titles because when you receive them as such certain things are triggered in the realm of the spirit for example if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet. The Bible didn't say if you receive a believer in the name of a believer. He said if you receive a prophet in the name of the prophet, you shall receive a prophet's reward. If, that, if, if the title wasn't important, then God would say, okay, if you receive the person I sent to you to come and tell you something, then you're going to get the reward that he comes and tells you. No, but the Bible was specific. If you receive a prophet, if you receive a righteous man, those are titles, not just adjectives, not just descriptions. They are delineations of authority and command in the realm of the spirit that, that, that causes certain dimensions of grace to come to you. We need a reformation in the church. We need a reformation by spiritual understanding. Number two, let's go to number two, the preaching prophet, the nataf, N-A-T-A-P-H, the nataf. I'm using Hebrew words here. Ezekiel 20, verse 46, Amos 7, verse 16, Micah 2, verse 12, verse 11. Ezekiel 20, 46, son of man, 
set thy face toward the south and drop thy word towards the south. Now that word drop there is the word nataf. Drop thy word towards the south and prophesy against the forest of the south field. I'm just highlighting the word for you. Amos 7, 16. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. Thou sayest prophesy not against Israel and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. <laughs> now some of you, when, when you come to church, some people make statements like, oh, the pastor is preaching against me. He's dropping word against me. Yes, I'm going to drop word against you. Who else am I supposed to preach? When I preach, I prophesy. Who else am I supposed to drop the word? I'm going to drop word for you. Drop thy word. Hmm? Micah 2 verse 11. If a man walking in the spirit and falls would lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. In other words, he is a lying prophet, a false prophet, bringing lying words, preaching things that you want to hear. Now, nataf means to drop, drip, or distill. <clears throat> it is related to nabi in the sense that the person who is preaching is doing so under inspiration and not preparation. So I want you to note that difference. What's the difference between the nataf, the preaching prophet, and a regular preacher. Well, the preaching prophet is preaching under inspiration and not preparation. The manner of the message is like a preacher who is operating under an open heaven. That is little by little until it increases into a torrential pour. Now, these prophets speak to congregations through the messages that are given to them by the Holy Spirit from the scriptures. They bring a whole different level of revelation and allow individuals to see things that are hidden in the scriptures. They are not systematic Bible preachers. They preach under the prophetic unction called inspiration or revelation. So they will use Bible stories and verses as metaphoric prophecies in the now. So when the, when the Nataf comes, he's going to take a story and that story is going to be the prophecy that is going to drop like rain inside of that congregation or in the ears of the people who are hearing it. That's the nataf or the preaching prophet. Number three, the seer prophet. Now, most of you are familiar with the seer because this one now seems to be getting more common these days. The seer prophet. First Chronicles 26, verse 28. Second Chronicles 16, verse 7. This is the Rohe, R-O-E-H. First Chronicles 26, 28. And all that Samuel the seer, the Rohe, and Saul the son of Kish, and Abner the son of Ner, and Joab the son of Zeruah had dedicated. And whatsoever I had dedicated anything, it was under the hand of Shilomith, <laughs> Shilomith <laughs> and of his brethren. So the word seer there is the word Rohe. Second Chronicles 16, 7. And at that time, Hanani the seer, the Rohe, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is this host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. That's the seer. Now, Rohe means to see by means of a vision, inspection, perception, or consideration. So it's not just a vision. It's also inspecting something, perceiving something, or considering something. First Samuel 9, verse 9, 2 Samuel 15, 27. These are all scriptures you can read. It refers to the past or present happening. So when a seer is operating, he is seeing things that are either past or currently happening. So seers or the seer prophet, they function through the prophetic realm of sight. Now, I want you to begin to see sight in four different realms. One, vision, meaning you're seeing with the eyes, whether physically or supernaturally. Two, inspection, where the Holy Spirit allows you to 
investigate something and to see things and see underneath what others are not seeing. To perceive or to consider. These are realms of sight. So for the prophet to prophesy, the seer prophet, it comes through sight perceptions. It comes through sight, perceptions, inspections, considerations. And it might come like revelation flashes, word pictures, symbols that appear before the prophet, smells, clear visions. It might even come as a feeling, as a sensation. All of these is in the seer realm. All of these are in the seer realm. So it's not just the eyes, okay? Seers are able to tell you details of things that you know about, like things that are in your house, places you go, etc. They are also able to fill in gaps for you concerning things that have affected you. So you will come to a seer and you will tell the seer your issue. Or you might not tell him, whichever way it works. But you tell the seer your story. And the seer now said to you, the reason why you're having this problem is because of this. And when the seer tells you that, you don't, you, you would not think about what the seer is telling you because you are not seeing it. But the seer is the one who is seeing it. Because God is speaking to him, whether through a vision, an inspection, a perception, or a consideration. Remember these four things. These are four dimensions of sight in the seer realm. And each of these can be broken down further. So you can understand the seer realm is broad. What I'm trying to do here tonight is to help you to understand the complexities and the diversities of the operations of the prophets and the different types so that we do not come into a, a, a stage, a state where we are comparing, contrasting, vilifying and demonizing and belittling the graces that God has out there. Number three, prophet, the seer prophet. Number four, the watchman prophet. This is the word shamar, S-H-A-M-A-R. These are transliterations now. So let's give a few scriptures. Genesis 2.15, Genesis 3.24, Genesis 4 verse 9, Jeremiah 51 verse 12, Hosea 12 verse 13, Ezekiel 33 verse 6, Isaiah 62 and verse 6. Let's read them. Genesis 2.15, And the Lord God took the man, and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to shamar it, to keep it. Genesis 3.24 So the Lord drove out the men and he placed at the east the garden of Eden, cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every which way to shamar the way of the tree of life, to keep it. Genesis 4 verse 9 And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's shamar? Am I my brother's keeper? Jeremiah 51 verse 12. Set up the standard upon the walls of Babylon. Make the watch strong. Set up the watchmen. Prepare the ambushes. For the Lord hath both devised and done that which he spake against the inhabitants of Babylon. The word shamar, the watch, the watchmen. Hosea 12 verse 13. And by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. And by a prophet was he preserved. That's the word shamar. Ezekiel 33 verse 6. But if the watchman sees the sword and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword come, if the sword comes and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. His blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Here again, we have the word shamar being displayed here in Ezekiel 33.6. Isaiah 62 
and verse 6. I have set a watchman upon the walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day or night, that you may make mention of the Lord and not keep silent. So here again, we have a type of prophet, the watchman. Now, shamar means to keep, to guard, to observe, to give heed, to watch for, to observe, or to wait for. Let's read this again. It means to keep, to guard, to observe, to give heed, to watch for, to observe, to wait for. Shamar represents those that watch over a particular realm, sphere, dimension, or people. The watchman prophet. Now, the watchman, they are assigned to a spy for the people. What does that mean? To see things the people can't see. That's the watchman. His assignment is to see things the people can't see. And these are prophets who see things that others will not be able to. And as a result, the watchmen can be mocked or scoffed at. Now we're going somewhere. The watchman's assignment allows them to function on the intercessory plane as prophetic intercessors. They are strong people of prayer. The watchman prophet, his duty is to ensure the protection of God's people from the plans and advances of the enemy, while at the same time protecting the sphere to which God has given them charge over. They are the ones who are shown things by God so that they can handle them in the place of prayer as well as edifying the people in that sphere. Now they raise up intercessors and they stir others in the place and ministry of prayer. Now you can understand there are some churches that their focus is just prayer, 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 prayer. And you're wondering, why is this church just prayer, prayer, prayer? Everything they read, that they do is prayer. Every book they write is prayer. Why? Because they are watchmen. They are watchmen prophets. Now, watchmen are usually sent out. Now, I want you to understand this now. They are sent out to warn people. Last week, we talked about those who warn, the portfolio of warning. Watchmen have that portfolio. The prophet, the watchman, is usually sensitized by God concerning impending dangers, tragedies, or judgments, or, or, or when people are going astray. Now, the watchman can go forth and warn the people of what is to come if they go a particular direction or if they fail to address certain issues. Watchmen can be very powerful to stir the people to repentance so that cities can turn back to God. Satan hates watchmen because these prophets get the people to fortify themselves and close open doors to the devil. Now, the watchman can see 10 years into the future. He can see into the beyond. He can see into the plans of the enemy. The watchman carries a sword and it's a two-edged sword. One side is to protect the people from incoming danger. The other is to warn them. When the watchman speaks, because remember the word is like a sword. It is going out to protect you against the powers of darkness. It is going out to secure you from what the enemy wants to do. Now, last week we spoke about the whole portfolio of warning that God may send a prophet to warn you. And that warning can either avert, can either cause you to uh, preserve yourself or to protect yourself in the issue if God will not change it. The watchman is there to do that. 
And so we are saying, listen, if God is telling you that an earthquake is coming, why is he telling you that? Because God is not a news carrier. God is not a, a, a news channel that he will just be giving you bad news. If the warner goes out and say, this is coming, what are we to do with it? Because you see, we have not been demanding more from the graces that are out there. Some people can see but they are not watchmen. A true watchman, hear me very well, a true watchman will be able to tell you what you are supposed to do, whether to avert, protect, or preserve. When I say preserve, run. Can I pray this thing away? Am I going to, is this thing coming? Is it inevitable? And we are going to have to do things to protect ourselves in the danger? Do we have to face it? And if we have to face it, what are we supposed to do? Should we stock up on water? Should we stock up on rice? Should we stock up on flour? Should we button down our roof? What? Or are we supposed to run from this place? The watchman is supposed to give you that wisdom. So it's not just to tell you, oh, earthquake is coming. Oh, storm is coming. Oh, uh, 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 three people are going to be killed. Oh, don't go. Uh, please, Mr. Watchman, we need more. And if you're not a watchman, you're a familiar spirit. Because if you cannot give us the solution, you're not from God. You're not hearing from God. You might be seeing something, but it's not God who is showing it to you. Watchmen bring solution. They bring solution to issues. And this is one of the reasons why the prophetic became so tainted. And people don't respect the prophetic. Because people are saying things. They are, they are, they are uttering judgments. They are uttering doom. They are uttering things that bring destruction. But no solution. And they will sit down waiting for the volcano to erupt. And for 5,000 people to die so that they can say, I told you so. The devil is a liar. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. You're not sent from God. Sorry. The watchman prophet is to keep to God, to observe, to watch for, to wait for. So that he can protect the people of God. In a particular dimension, realm, or sphere. Number five. Are you enjoying this tonight? Are you learning anything? Number five. The dreaming prophet. The visionary dreaming prophet. Second Kings 17 verse 13. The cause. This is related to the chaza. We spoke about the seer earlier and in one of the words we spoke about the, the kaza where the sia is in the realm so you have the kaza the rohe and the koze in the sia in 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 the sight dimension but we separate this now to talk about the visionary prophet now let's let's go into this yet the lord testified second kings 17 13 the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to the law which I command your fathers, which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Now the Kose, C-H-O-Z-E-H, -E is one who peers into the distance. Chaza, which we spoke about earlier, means to gaze at something mentally or to perceive something or to have supernatural sight by visions and dreams. Now, Chaza means to see, perceive, look upon, behold, with the intent to provide prophetic declarations by means of what is seen in a dream. Now, they are, they are both related words, the Chaza and the Kose. Now, these prophets, the visionary dreaming prophet, they operate in the realm of visions, 
whether dreams, open visions, trances, and things like that. Now, these prophets, they are shown things in symbols and in parables. Prophets like Ezekiel, Daniel, Joseph, they operated in the dreaming realm. They are prophets. Prophets who operate in this realm are usually capable of interpreting dreams and are usually active in seeing angels and other spirits. So these are, uh, what do you call it now? These are dimensions to what is happening in this prophetic sphere. The prophets who operate in the vision dream realm, so we are, we are, I, I said visionary dream realm because the dream is like a vision and some visions, they are like dreams. They, they, are, they operate simultaneously sometimes. But the dreaming prophet, let's, let's stick to this one. The prophets who operate in the dream realm, there are several types of dreams, visions and dreams that they will get. Number one, they will get prophetic dreams. Number two, so that's Genesis 37, verse 5 to 7. So I'm talking about the different types of visions and dreams. They are being combined. I'm going to separate them in a little bit. They'll get prophetic dreams. Prophetic dreams include warning dreams, Matthew 2, verse 12, and Genesis 20, verse 3. Predictive dreams, Genesis 40, verse 5. Parable dreams, Genesis 37, verse 7 and verse 9. And ministry dreams, Acts 16, verse 9 to 10. So these are the type of prophetic dreams. Warning dreams, predictive dreams, dreams that are parables, and ministry dreams. So you can put those under that category. Number two type of visions and dreams that we're dealing with is a wakeful vision, meaning that you are awake when this is happening. First Kings 22, verse 16 to 17. So you're wide awake. Number three type of vision is hearing words. Yes, hearing words is operating in the visionary realm. It's, you, you might say, but this is audible. Yes, because there is a modality called the audible voice of God, but it's also in the visionary realm. So hearing words, 1 Samuel 3, verse 9, and verse 10 to 11. This is where the prophet is hearing God, but they are not seeing God, but God is present right there. So God did not make himself visible, but he made himself audible, but he's right there. Samuel experienced that. Number four. They, you are seeing the speaker and hearing the words. Joshua 5, verse 13 to 14. Joshua encountered an angel. Yes? Number five. Well, he encountered the angel of the Lord. That was uh, Christophany, or the, uh, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. Number five. you An angel speaking. So you are seeing the angel. Zechariah 1, verse 7 to 9. And number 6, the voice of the Lord. Isaiah 6 and verse 8. So these are the six different types of visions and dreams in the visionary dreaming realm that the dream visionary dreaming prophet is operating by. And then the four types of prophetic dreams that are in this realm, warning dreams, predictive dreams, parable dreams, ministry dreams. And we gave the scriptures for all of these. So this is the Kose and the Kaza that is going on here. Visions and dreams separate from the whole matter of the Sia prophet. Number six, the predicting prophet. 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 2, and Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Let's read these two scriptures. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, 
O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. 1 Kings 13 verse 2 was fulfilled in 2 Kings 22 verse 1 to 2 and 2 Kings 23 verse 15 to 18. I know I'm going fast. Catch the recording and you'll get the scriptures. Now, between the giving of the prophecy in 1 Kings 13 verse 2 and the fulfillment of the prophecy in 2 Kings 22 and 23, there was a 300-year gap. That, that's how serious this prophet is, that he could predict something 300 years away. Now, let's go to Micah 5 verse 2 because I'm about to say something to you. But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet one of thee shall come forth, yet out of thee sorry, shall come forth, Unto me, he that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Do you realize in Micah 5 verse 2, God literally told them that God was coming? And he will come out of Bethlehem. Who else will share the description of his goings forth have been from old, from everlasting? That is only God, the ancient of days. So literally... Micah the prophet told Israel that the ancient of days <coughs> is going to come out of Bethlehem. My God. It can't get any deeper and clearer than that. Now, let's look how deep this prophecy is. This is a prediction. Micah 5 verse 2 was fulfilled in Matthew 2 verse 1 and 2. Now, can you guess how many years this was? between the giving of the prophecy and the fulfillment? 700 years. Now, when we are dealing with a predicting prophet, you have to be careful because a predicting prophet can prophesy things that will never be fulfilled in his lifetime. And people in the prophet's generation might call him a false prophet because what he said didn't come to pass in his generation. Hear me, saints, and hear me well. <laughs> when it comes to prophets, let God be the judge of them. <laughs> when it comes to prophets, I said, let God be the judge of them. Because if you were in the days of Micah or if you were in the days when the prophecy concerning Josiah was given and you were a boy or a little girl when those prophecies were given and you reached 90 or 120 and the prophecy was not fulfilled, you might have declared that prophet to be a false prophet because what you heard the prophet said didn't come to pass in your lifetime. Yet it would come to pass 300 years later or 700 years later. Listen, be careful. Now let's talk about the predicting prophet. These prophets, the predicting prophets, are concerned with future events and can give accurate predictions of what is to come. Now the predicting prophet, what the Holy Spirit does is that he takes this prophet into the future. He breaks the time barrier and sends this prophet into the future. The prophet does not know which time frame he went. All the prophet knows is that he saw something or he heard something and he's saying what he saw or he heard and he, he doesn't know what time frame and he comes back and he begins to prophesy and he tells you, this is what is going to happen. When they speak, it is to give us wisdom and insight into what God will do and how we should respond or prepare ourselves for what is to come. Now, prediction is never to tickle our fancy concerning future events. 
We are not news carriers. Prophets are not news carriers who scratch the itch of people who want to know something new. We are not here to tell you which lot or number is going to play next week. Rather, the predicting prophet is sent by God so that people can align themselves to the will of God. Now, this is very serious. For example, if a prophet predicts a particular political outcome, we must ask ourselves, what does God want of us? Because this is what the prophet is seeing. Should we vote for that man or should we vote for another? Should we pray that that man goes into office or should we pray him out? Predictions are for further inquiry into the mind and heart of God. Listen, Christians, we are a prophetic people. Stop behaving like religious people. If the prophets get up and say, hey, I see this happening. You need to listen what God is saying because you might not like a political leader. But this is what God is saying. If you were living, if some of you were living in the days of Jeremiah, you would have stoned him. Because Jeremiah said, surrender to the king of Babylon. Surrender to Babylon? How do you want me to surrender to Babylon when we have a king here? No, God rejected that king and said, surrender to Babylon. That was the will of God. Now, could you imagine what would have happened if Israel had surrendered to Babylon? That the 70-year captivity would not have happened. God would have seen their obedience and their humility, forgiven them of their 490-year trespass, and allowed Israel to be restored in a manner that would preserve the kingship of Israel. Listen, you don't know the mind of God. When the prophet speaks by a prophet, mighty God of Daniel, are you preserved? By a prophet, are you preserved? Stop behaving like you know more than God. Prophets who operate in the, in the predicting realm may say things that can take decades to come to pass. Josiah's prophecy, 300 years. Micah's prophecy, 700 years. Isaiah's prophecy, 700 and odd years. Let us be careful how we judge them. Whenever pr predictions are given that may not be fulfilled in your lifetime, God may give the prophet a sign as to the truth of the prediction or the longevity and maturity of the prophet's accuracy over the years would vouch for the prophecy. That is being given. Let's be careful. The predicting prophet. Is a type of prophet. And we must be careful. How we. Interpret predictions. That are given. By the prophets of God. Number seven. The teaching prophet. Daniel chapter 18. And verse 18. Acts chapter 20. Verse 7 and verse 17 to 20 and verse 27. No, that, sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 18, sorry, and verse 18. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and will put that my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Acts 20 verse 27, this is Paul speaking. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Now, let's look at this. Now, while this may sound contradictory, teaching prophet, we must remember that there are diversities of operations within gifts. Prophets and teachers are two separate gifts. We know that. A prophet is one who gives revelation. A teacher explains revelation. Prophets 
are those through whom God reveals truth. Teachers explain the truth of God's word. The teaching prophet is therefore one who has the grace to both reveal and explain truth. And so this may happen in a number of ways. I'm going to give you about three ways. Number one, the prophet is shown something from God concerning a person, a place, a situation, and then he explains what he sees. So for example, the prophet would say something like, in the realm of the spirit, the Lord showed me two birds standing on a tree. One flew and the other fell to the ground. Now hear the word of the Lord. That's what the prophet saw. Now he says, now hear the word of the Lord. And the prophet would move now to explain what he saw and may now use even the scriptures to explain what he saw. Number two, we're talking about the way in which the teaching prophet operates. God may allow the prophet to teach the scriptures in a manner that is different from the regular dogmatic style of teaching. So this means the prophet will help you to see things that are not apparent to others who may teach the same thing. Apostle Paul was like that. He used the same Torah the Pharisees and the, and, and the scribes and the Sadducees were using, but he was able by revelation to show Jesus Christ. Who else operated like that? The Lord Jesus operated like that. He would use the same Torah, the same word of God. Jesus referred to the Psalms more than any other book. And he would teach from out of Deuteronomy. And he would explain things in a manner that others would not explain it. The two men on the road of Emmaus, they were walking with Jesus. And the scripture says that he opened their understanding and their hearts burned within them. That's the prophet. That's the teaching prophet. Number three, the teaching prophet edifies, exhorts, and comforts the believer. Now, how does this work? He uses the things that are happening in the life of the believer to teach them the will and the counsel of the Lord. So the prophet edifies them about what is happening on the spiritual front, exhorts the believer in regard to the word of God concerning the matter, and comforts the believer with the will of God concerning the believer in that situation. When the prophet is done, the believer will be edified and their faith lifted. A teaching prophet can be considered as a personal pastoral prophet. They can shepherd a congregation, especially people who are highly prophetic. Teaching prophets will have prophetic schools. When we talk about teaching prophets, you must understand that they are not necessarily systematic in the way they teach. This is because you will find that they may be addressing topics in random ways. They address or they teach on issues as they are led by the Holy Spirit. The, there's a difference between the teaching prophet and the teacher. Teachers are usually systematic. What does that mean? Their teachings are planned and they are carefully thought about building up the believers from one level to the next. A teaching prophet, however, he can address gifts this week and next week he's addressing sin. He's not systematic. He goes according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's the teaching prophet for you. Number eight type of prophet, maybe you have not heard of this, is what I call the martyred prophet. Let's give you some scriptures. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, my two martyrs, my two martyrs, and they shall prophesy. Hold on here. Martyrs prophesying. Okay. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Okay. Hold that verse. Acts chapter 7, verse 55 and 56. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven. Now hold on here. 
Stephen was looking into heaven. I thought it was only prophets and prophetic people who can do that. And he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now, this is serious stuff. This is a serious vision. He saw the glory of God. Now, for those of you who fight against the triune God, here he is, the Holy Ghost, full of Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost. He opened Stephen's eyes. He saw the glory of God. It's another person. And Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Oh my God. How can we not see this? God is one in being, but three in manifestation or person. Verse 56, and said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. Now look at verse 22, sorry, Acts 22 and verse 20. Is it Acts 22? Yes. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, this is Paul now giving a report, I was also standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that killed him. How did Paul describe Stephen? He said he was a martyr, the martyr Stephen. Now, who is a martyr? A martyr is a person who is killed for their beliefs. Simply put. The Greek word martus, M-A-R-T-U-S, means a witness. Now, in Revelation 11 verse 3, you saw two witnesses, two martus that prophesied. In Acts chapter 7, you saw Stephen who was having prophetic visions. And in Acts 22, you saw Paul describing Stephen as a martyr. What's going on here? What does it mean to be a witness? Three things. One, a witness. Martus means a witness in a legal sense, meaning you can give an account in court. It means a witness in historical sense meaning you can show something that has happened or you can tell something that has happened. Or it means a witness in an ethical sense. Those who, by example, prove the genuineness of their faith by undergoing a violent death. Now, prophets who are martyrs are individuals sent by God to upset the minds of people to reveal their hearts. Let me say it again. Martyred prophets or martyr prophets are those who are sent by God to upset the minds of people to reveal their hearts. They will reveal and preach things that will make people angry. Listen, when you come across a martyr prophet. Don't try to tell that prophet to tone down his words. Don't try to tell that prophet to say it better. Don't try to tell that prophet that he could say it this way or that way. The way he said it is the way God wants him to say it. Because the intent is to upset their mind so that their hearts can be revealed. Hmm. Their intent is to make people angry. They not only preach these martyrs, but their lifestyle is also to be a prophetic enigma against the people they are living amongst. So God can take a prophet and tell a whole story, a whole prophecy by the life of that prophet. The prophet's life is a prophecy. Don't just look at what the prophet is saying. Look at what is also happening in the prophet's life. It's also a prophecy. Martyrs are at some point killed for what they are saying. Killed for their lifestyle. 
killed for their message and their blood will become a record against the people who killed them. You cannot convince martyrs to speak or live contrary to their calling. It is their call. It is their purpose. God will use the message, lifestyle, and death of the martyr to judge the people or dispensation they were set in. Woe unto you, Bethsaida. Woe unto you, Chorazin. For if the people of Sodom and Gomorrah had what you had today, they would have repented. <laughs> My God. The killing of a martyr can happen in three ways. Literally, socially, or spiritually. Now let's look at that. Number one, the prophet is killed literally for his message because it offends the people's spirituality, mentality, and society. It offends them. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 36 and 37. Some were laughed at and beaten. Others were tied up and put in prison. They were killed with stones. They were cut in half. They were killed with swords. The only clothes some of them had were sheepskins or goatskins. They were poor, persecuted, and treated badly by others. Who? Is Hebrews 11, 36 to 37 referring to the prophets. So let me give you some examples. Prophet Isaiah. He was sawn in two by King Manasseh. Meaning King Manasseh took a saw and cut Isaiah in two. Saw him like a piece of board. Ezekiel the prophet was killed by the elders of Israel. The, the, the elders of the Israelite exiles in Babylon because they were rebuked for worshiping idols. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Jeremiah, prophet Jeremiah, was stoned to death by his people at Tafnai in Egypt. Zechariah, son of Jehoiada, was stoned to death in the temple courtyard because of his prophecy. Go and read it in 2 Chronicles 24. Verse 20 to 22. Jesus was crucified. Because Pharisees and Sadducees. Did not like his teachings. That exposed and reproved them. We know why Jesus came. He came to die for our sins. But do you know why the Pharisees killed him? Because they hated his teachings. So the literal killing of a prophet. Number two way, the social killing. The prophet is socially killed. He is heavily persecuted for his message, his lifestyle or work. Jeremiah was persecuted for his prophecies against Israel. We talk about Jeremiah being let down in a pit being tied up in the, te in, the, in the courtyard and all kinds of things that they did to Jeremiah. Elisha was mocked in 2 Kings 2 verse 23. Amos and others were told to keep quiet. Amos 2 verse 12 and Amos 7 verse 13. Some were barred from the temple. Others were rejected. Some had to live in caves and hide for their lives, like the prophets that Obadiah had to feed in the caves. Because they were hiding from Jezebel. Their social life was destroyed. Killed as a result of their calling. They had no social life. The prophets. The martyred prophets. And number three. Third way. The prophet can be killed. He may experience what I call a spiritual killing. There may be aspects of the prophet's life. Where he finds no enjoyment. He can't enjoy certain things. This may be because of three things. Number one. It is a requirement by God. Because of the calling. Number two. It's a consequence of the calling. And number three. It's continuous attack from the spirit realm. Because of the calling. So for example. The prophet may be told. You cannot have wife or children. He might have a dead marital life. 
Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 16 verse 2, was told, you cannot take a wife. Daniel was not married because they, 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 um, they made him a eunuch. Consequence. The prophet might not have any money or any resource. Dead financial life. Elijah and Elisha. 1 Kings 17, verse 7 to 16. Elisha was fed by a widow. Do you know how poor that is? <laughs> Do you know how poor you have to be for a raven to be feeding you? Dead financial life. No money. No resource. Number three. They might not have any house of their own. Dead material life. Jesus. Foxes of holes and birds of nests. Son of man. Remember we said son of man is a title that refers to prophets. Son of man have nowhere to lay his head. What about the prophets that Obadiah had to feed in caves? Imagine you're a prophet and your bed and your pillow. Your bed is the ground and your pillow is a stone. You still want to be a prophet? But if you are called in the realm of the martyrs, you might not be literally killed. But you might be socially killed or spiritually killed. Some aspects of your life might, might receive death. Whatever your case may be, when God calls one to be a prophet, he will find himself in one of these eight categories. You might have overlaps at times, but the prophet will be known in one of these major categories. Now here is the thing. You don't get to choose. What kind of prophet you are. If. We could choose. What kind of prophet we are. Me. The martyr part. No. I don't want that part. I ain't choosing that part. That part. No. You, I'm not going to be choosing that part at all mm -mm. who who would want who would want that eh? and so we thank god that the holy spirit is the one that chooses if i was going to choose something i would say give me the seer and give me the inspiration and give me the teaching and give me the prediction but leave, leave martyr business down there no don't put that one inside of it at all I don't want to be no watchman because they don't like watchmen. They will stone watchmen. Hmm? Yes, eight major types of prophets. The inspirational prophet, the preaching prophet, the seer prophet, the watchman prophet, the visionary dreaming prophet, the predicting prophet, the teaching prophet, and the martyr prophet. So let's conclude this thing. Prophets receive messages in different ways. Various words are translated as prophecy in the scriptures. Different types of prophets exist within the body of Christ, with diversities of operations. Prophets are called by Jesus and are part of the governmental structure of the church. Prophets must be mentored and discipled until they are mature to stand on their own with sound theology. A prophet must never attempt to teach if he's not skilled in the word or called in that sphere. No matter the type of prophet that one is, the prophet will go through processing pains and persecutions. God is the one who calls prophets. Let me say it again. God is the one who calls prophets. They ought to be accepted, received, and honored as they are still in operation today. So let us not put every prophet in the same category. Prophets are different, but each one is necessary. So let us stop comparing and contrasting, and let us receive and honor them as God sent them to us because they are Christ's messengers. Ephesians chapter 4, and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. Verse 12 and 13 says, Christ gave these gifts to prepare God's holy people for the work of serving to make the body of Christ stronger. This work must continue until we are all joined together in what we believe and in what we know about the Son of God. Our goal is to become like a full-grown man to look just like Christ and have all his perfections. Amen and amen. God bless you. And we'll see you next week again. Amen.